Our next speaker is an associate professor of physics at UVA. He's the leader of the university studies of the Bose-Einstein condensation of atomic gases, examining the nature of particle movement to redefine our conception of reality on a microscopic level. TEDxUVA is proud to pre present Professor Cass Sackett. I would dispute that that was not science that we just saw. But in any case, it's not my kind of science, I suppose. Uh, so yes, I'm a physicist. Um, that's not everyone's favorite class. I think that's a shame. I think physics is really great, but it's not, not I guess, for everyone. Uh, so in case it's been a little while since you took a physics class, what physics is about is, um, thank you. Uh, physics is about understanding the world around us at sort of the most uh, basic kind of fundamental level, understanding how things move, the forces between objects, what holds the whole world together, uh, you know, sort of understanding that, and, and thinking about it in a very precise and quantitative way. We, you, if you have had a physics course, you know we have all these sort of complicated mathematical formulas, and we compare them to careful experiments, and we try to make sure that they agree. Um, so if you're going to be successful at this kind of thing, you have to have a very clear-eyed view of reality, uh, because there's not a lot of room for interpretation or, or opinion. You have to you know, the, the math says what it says, and the experiments do what they do, and they kind of either agree or they don't. So you have to get it right. Um, and that leads a little bit to a, a very, um, a sort of a lot of self-confidence among physicists, because when we feel like we have gotten something right, we call it a law of nature, and, and we say, this is how it is. So when I say, for instance, that uh, force is equal to mass times acceleration, F equals ma, uh, I'm, I'm right. You know, if, if you disagree with me, then maybe you don't exactly understand what I mean, and that's completely fair. That's, I'm very reasonable. Uh, or else you're deluded, which is reasonable too, but not really my, my concern. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so physicists tend to be pretty confident about our, our things. That can lead to trouble when you apply that to other areas of life, like whose turn it is to do the dishes tonight. Um, but at least within our own little area of expertise, you know, we, we kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so when it comes to the theme for today, the reinventing the wheel, you might say physics might not have that much to say, right? Physicists were the ones who invented the wheel. Uh, we got it right. What is this reinvention business? <laughs> uh, so, so, but it turns out that's actually not really true at all. We, we always have to be sort of reanalyzing and rethinking about things. Um, and so I want to tell you a story today about, about a, a case where we had to really just basically reinvent reality at a very, very deep level uh, and hold that up maybe as an example for, for the the power of reinvention uh, in, in understanding and making progress in solving problems. So the story starts, actually, uh, when we learned about atoms. About 100 years ago, we started learning about atoms. Atoms are the little teeny weeny things that make up everything around us. Uh, and originally, they were supposed to be these little indivisible units that couldn't be divided any further. Well, that turned out to be wrong. They're actually made of even smaller things. Uh, uh, and the standard model we, we, we figured out was that there's a, a nucleus a little heavy bit inside, and then uh, electrons are a little bit lighter and they fly around the outside. Uh, and those two things attract each other, the nucleus and the electrons attract each other together, which is great because otherwise the atoms would fly apart and that would pretty much suck. Um, so, uh, so that was good, um, but it kind of was a little bit confusing because the electrons in the nucleus, although they attract each other, they never really come together and stick. Uh, and that's good too because I also don't really want my atoms to, to collapse into nothing. That, that would also suck. Um, but the uh, but it's a little bit confusing because of this whole force equals mass times acceleration business, right? I have these two particles attracting each other, but they don't actually come together. So that seems to violate our law that we enshrined and called a called law. Um, so that was a big puzzle, and it was, it was hard. People thought hard and long about it for a long time and tried to figure out how to resolve that. Uh, and it turned out to do it, we had to, to throw that away. In fact, we, we had to get rid of F equals MA, at least on the basic level. Um, and replace it with this much more complicated theory called quantum mechanics. Um, this is the basic formula of it. I won't try to explain. I won't, I won't torture you with that. Uh, but you can see it looks a little more complicated. Um, and uh, along with that more advanced theory, uh, we had to basically give up of all, not just sort of tweak the formula around, we had to give up the whole underpinnings that went into sort of our, our natural understanding of motion. Uh, in particular, the idea that an object has a definite position, that, you know, like I am exactly where I am, it's a very intuitive and, and basic thing that we think we understand. Um, but it turns out when you look closely, and especially at, at little small things like, like atoms, uh, and especially actually when you're not looking at them, if you look at things, they tend to, to pin them down. So I see you all out there, and you're in definite places. Um, but if you were atoms and I wasn't looking at you, you could actually be kind of spread out over a big area, not just because I didn't know where you were, 
but because you didn't actually have a well-defined position at all. In some sense, you, you were kind of everywhere all at once. Um, so, so that's confusing and hard to think about, and I don't have a particularly easier time thinking about it than you do. Um, but it does solve the atom problem. So if you think about how that applies to atoms, it says that, well, we have these electrons and, and nuclei, and they're moving around, but we, we, we can't say exactly where they are. They're just spread out. Um, so in fact, they are as close as they get. They are already, the, the electrons are right on top of the, the nucleus like we think. They're attracting each other and they pulled each other as close as they could get. It's just that the electrons and the nucleus are all kind of fuzzy and so that's sort of the size of the atom. That's why it can't collapse is because we, we don't know exactly where anything is in it. So that solved the problem. Uh, in fact, we now that, that quantum theory, the quantum mechanics is a, is a great theory. It explains atoms really, really, really well. Exquisite detail, so that's nice. Um, but there was a pretty substantial cost to that, right? We had to throw away our sort of natural notion of how things are. The idea that objects have positions is sort of, you know, you figure that out when you're maybe two years old or something, uh, and it normally sticks with you through your whole life. Um, so giving that up is kind of a, a, a significant thing. Um, one immediate lesson maybe you could draw from that is uh, don't take anything for granted, right? Even the most obvious things might turn out not to be true when you look closely enough. Uh, and that's a good thing to know. Um, but to be fair, atoms are these little tiny small things. They're too small to see. For practical purposes, you can kind of ignore that stuff most of the time. So you might you know, not pay too much attention. People tend to say, well, you physicists, go do your little thing in the corner, and that's nice. But we're going to not worry about these weird details of, of, of things not being the way we think. Um, so is there some reason that everyone or or, or you should be interested in this kind of thing. Uh, and there is actually a reason. is because when you understand things really well, uh, that lets you use them better. The better you understand something, the better you can use it. Uh, and so I'll tell you a little bit about some applications of this kind of stuff uh, that, uh, that, that I do. Um, so, so, so I use this, this I study this, this thing called a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a fancy thing I won't get into too much detail about. But it has its roots in a, in a fact that along with this giving up the, the idea that objects have definite locations, you also kind of have to give up the idea that objects have definite identities too. Um, so different atoms of the same type, like different hydrogen atoms, uh, are, are exactly the same. There's, there's no difference between them. Um, so if I have an atom in one spot and an atom in the other spot, I can't say atom A is here and atom B is here because there's just no difference between atom A and B. It could equally well be B over here and, and A over here. I can't assign a, a little name tag to an atom. There's just no way to do that. Um, so, so you have to kind of give up on the idea that atom A and B are, are, are distinguishable things and just say, well, I've got an atom here and an atom here and just kind of keep quiet about which one's which and, and that's okay. Um, so that's maybe all right. But then it gets a little trickier if you put the atoms kind of close together. You get them cold enough and close enough together that, that even say one's here and one's here isn't really true. They're both kind of right here. And so it starts to get hard to say that there's even sort of separate atoms at all. There's just kind of this big fuzz of, of stuff. Uh, and because of that, when you get to this condition, um, the, the atoms undergo kind of a change. They, they kind of condense into this weird collective state, which we call a, a Bose condensate where it doesn't really look like individual atoms at all anymore. It's just this kind of soupy mess of quantum uncertainty and everything. Um, so that's an interesting thing that happens. It's kind of fun to, to, to look at. Um, it's important uh, for many reasons, but one uh, that strikes close to home, uh, it's the principle that underlies something called a superconductor. Uh, so a superconductor is a special material that lets electricity, like electrical current, go through it like a wire, but without any energy loss at all. Most, most materials you put electricity through and they lose a little energy in the way. Um, but not a superconductor, the electricity just goes right through without any loss. Um, so that's a big deal. If, if we could replace like our electrical grid, right, all the power lines and all the motors and all the blenders and things, uh, with all the, if we replaced all those wires with superconductors, uh, we'd save something like 30% of all the electricity that we generate. Uh, and that would be a, a huge thing, right? That would be an enormous advance in terms of the environment and energy independence and a lot of things that we care about. Uh, so that'd be a big deal. It ties into this physics. Um, we can't actually do that yet. We can make these superconductors, but they only work at really low temperatures, uh, which is inconvenient, right? We can't really have our blenders at low temperatures. They're colder than a daiquiri even, so it's not good. Um, so, so we haven't figured that out yet, but to do that, we want to understand this physics better, so we're going to study these Bose condensates, um, and that's some of what I do. Um, 
I, in our lab, we, we can actually make these things actually out of atoms, and we can even take, uh, take pictures of them. That's a, a genuine photograph of one of these things. You see, it doesn't look like much. It looks like a big sort of quantum blur, because that's what it actually is. Um, so, so it's not so small, though. When we make these things, um, they're about a tenth of a millimeter across, the, the long way you're seeing there. So a tenth of a millimeter, that's about the smallest thing you can see with your eye, roughly. Um, but you can see it. So, so it's not just, doesn't this, this quantum business don't, doesn't only apply to little tiny atoms that are basically invisible. You can actually apply that to, to things that are on a, a somewhat of a large scale. Um, so it does tie into sort of life. Now, um, there's lots of things you can do with these condensates. We're interested in this particular kind of uh, application uh, we, we call atom interferometry, which is a bit of a tricky thing. Uh, and it rests on the idea that we can push atoms around in a nice, precise way uh, using light. Um, so if I have an atom here and I shine a laser beam on it, um, when I shine a laser beam on anything, it actually pushes on it. If I shine a laser on you, it pushes you just very gently. You wouldn't usually notice, but, but you can. Um, but atoms are so light that just a little gentle push can get them moving. So I can push on an atom and get it getting sliding over. So that's neat. We can push our atoms around and make them do what we want. Uh, the interesting question is, what happens if we push on it from both directions? I send two lasers on an atom. Um, so in our normal, natural way of thinking about things, right, if I push together on something sort of equally, it just doesn't go anywhere. The forces balance and it just sits still. Uh, but this quantum business says, well, it doesn't have to happen that way. The atom could just go both ways at the same time. So if I push on it two ways, it goes two ways, because quantum mechanics says it can do that. Um, so that's kind of crazy. We can actually do that. So they, now we've got these two, this atom in two places at the same time moving apart. Uh, we can take a picture of that too. Uh, so this is actually about 10,000 atoms. Um, same kind of picture, just processed to look kind of fancier with color. Um, so each of those peaks is, is a bunch of atoms. Actually, as you took the picture, the atoms kind of decide what they're going to be. Once you look at them, this whole quantum stuff kind of gets a little bit suppressed. So, so in the picture, there's some atoms in one place and some in the other. But before we took the picture, Every one of those atoms was in both of those places at the same time, about a millimeter now apart. A millimeter, maybe we can see that real easy. We don't even need a magnifying glass. Um, so that's kind of, again, I think, an amazing thing that you can see this kind of quantum strangeness on the scale that we're, we're used to dealing with, things that aren't so strange. Um, but what we like to do is actually not take a picture, not disturb the system, and instead shine the lasers again and, and, and bring those, those, those two sort of paths back together. The atom could have been in two places. We can recombine them, let them come back together, and then ask, can we reassemble our initial condensate out of those two pieces? Right? We broke it apart, and now it's in this, this, this complicated state. Can we bring it back and put it back together into just an original sort of atomic state again? And the answer to that turns out to be it depends. Um, if the environment, if while the, the two paths were apart, if, they were, if there was any difference in the environment surrounding them, and then that's a little bit like looking at them. There's some kind of difference between the two sides now. And so you can tell where it was, and that's as if you kind of looked at it. And if you try then to bring it back together, it doesn't work because the quantum mechanics has sort of been broken. Um, but if the environments are exactly the same, if the atom can't say if it went left or right and you bring it back together, in fact, you can. You could sort of put Humpty Dumpty back together again just fine. Um, so that's also sort of neat, but it has an interesting application because it's quite sensitive to that environment. And that lets you measure things about the environment. So a simple example would be if I did that same idea, I, but, I, but I split my thing so it, like, half of it went up, or I shouldn't say half. It either went up or down, or sort of both, and then bring it back together. Well, if it goes up, then it experiences a little bit of a uh, different gravity force than if it went down. That's the difference between up and down is the force of gravity. Uh, so that's a different environment. And so when I put the, the, the atoms back together or try, it won't work quite the same. And if I look carefully at what does happen, uh, it can let me measure gravity, the strength of gravity. So we can do that with a bathroom scale. But, but if you do this right, you can actually do it very, very precisely, like nine or eight or 10 digits. Um, so that's a lot. Uh, that's a very precise measurement. Measuring gravity that precisely is kind of like measuring your weight to about the accuracy of an eyelash or so. So that's kind of impressive. Um, it's uh, not just an academic thing. It's maybe cool to know how strong gravity is, but it actually has a, a, a lot of applications. So for instance, if you can make one of these things that was portable and not too expensive and reliable, uh, the army could use it to find like underground tunnels where the, the terrorists are hiding out, right? Because where the rock's missing, gravity would be a little weaker. You could tell that. 
uh, energy companies that are looking for oil could find it more accurately because, again, oil is a little lighter than rock, so you can map that out and figure out where the oil is and don't waste resources in the environment drilling, drilling without good purpose. Um, and even, you know, when we have our computer-controlled cars in a few years, uh, if you had a really precise gravity sensor, it can help it navigate by measuring little tiny fluctuations of gravity as you drive around and use those for sort of course corrections and, and marks to figure out where you are. So those are all actually kind of important things, right? Those would all be nice and useful things to have. Um, so we're trying to develop that kind of technology. It's, it's fun stuff. Um, but the main point uh, about it that I wanted to make today was that all of that is predicated on this quantum mechanical weirdness um, that we had to develop. Um, so, so if we were stuck with our old sort of natural ideas of motion that you know something's here, it's here, and if it moves, it moves, uh, then we wouldn't have these condensates, and we certainly wouldn't have atoms moving you know, in two places at the same time. You wouldn't be able to have all these applications that might be able to solve useful problems. And that's the really the, the big lesson that I wanted to, to, to share with you today, is that we shouldn't be afraid to reinvent things. We should be looking for opportunities to, uh, to, to reinvent reality or, or reinvent what we're thinking, because that's how we get out of conceptual boxes. If we're, we're stuck thinking about things in a certain way, we have to examine all of our preconceptions and be prepared to let go of them. Because when we do that, when we create new ideas, new ways of thinking about things, those may contain the, the solutions to old and long-standing problems that we care about. So thank you very much. <laughs>